The chamber of the Supreme Court Tuesday was once again at the center of a nationwide debate over abortion access. Almost two years after overturning Roe versus Wade, the justices heard arguments on the widely used abortion pill Mifepristone. CBS News Chief Legal Correspondent Jan Crawford reports. Mifepristone kills! Protests made clear the controversy. But inside the court, there appeared to be agreement, with a majority of justices on both sides of the ideological aisle highly skeptical of arguments to restrict use of the so-called abortion pill. A key question, why should courts be second-guessing scientific decisions by the FDA on how a drug is prescribed? Do you have concerns about judges parsing medical and scientific studies? At issue in the case, the drug Mifepristone, used with another drug in nearly two-thirds of abortions. A group of anti-abortion doctors argue the FDA wrongly expanded access to the pill in 2016, when it extended the window women can take it from seven to ten weeks, and during the pandemic in 2021, said an in-person doctor's visit was not needed, allowing mail-order pharmacies to ship the drug nationwide. Erin Hawley represents the doctors who say those changes led to increased emergency room visits and compromised women's health. Women are now left to receive these drugs in the mail or at in their dorm room without ever having been checked by a doctor for life-threatening conditions. That's reckless. Abortion rights supporters say mifepristone is the safest method of abortion, and the FDA, not the court system, has the final word on drug safety. The FDA acted on an extensive body of evidence and well within its authority and in accordance with the law. But in court, most of the 90-minute argument focused not on the merits of the FDA's decision to expand access, but whether the doctors even have legal standing to sue. Now, the argument suggests it's going to be a narrow procedural ruling for the FDA, which would preserve nationwide access uh, to the abortion pill. A decision is expected by the end of June. John? Jan Crawford at the Supreme Court. Thank you, Jan. CBS News legal contributor and Loyola Law School professor Jessica Levinson joins me now. Jessica, this case is about abortion access and about the FDA and its authority to approve drugs based on scientific evidence. So. What is the framework that guides the interests that should prevail here as the judges look at this? So the framework is that the justices and any judge should defer to the experts in an executive agency. And the framework here is that you only overturn a decision by the FDA or another similarly situated organization if that decision is arbitrary and capricious. And again, that is meant to protect the decisions of these executive agencies and say that judges shouldn't parachute in and stand in the shoes of the experts who are evaluating mifepristone, who are looking at reams of evidence as to its safety. But as Jan mentioned, that's not really what the arguments were about today. The arguments were about the people who brought this case and whether or not they have something called legal standing to sue. Walk us through that. What the what, why might they not have had standing uh, in this case? It's a great question. So they might not have standing because, as you know, to walk into a federal courthouse, you need an injury, and it has to be a concrete and particularized injury. You need that the action you're complaining about have caused that injury causation. You need redressability. You need that if you win, you will get some remedy. And with respect to the doctors who sued, what I heard probably seven, I think for sure five in my view, justices say this morning is, what's your injury? You are claiming that you might at some point have to serve a woman, have to provide care to a woman who was prescribed methacristone by someone else, had a rare side effect, and then you would then have to provide her with care, even though there are federal laws that would prevent people from having to provide care if they have a conscientious objection to that type of care. So finally, Jessica, this idea of standing, sometimes those who don't get their way because they don't have standing, they portray it as a kind of uh, technicality or something. Re take us to school here quickly at the end. Remind us why standing actually matters as a principle of law. Standing matters as a principle of law because you need to make sure that the people who are challenging an action are actually affected by that action. 
that you cannot say that federal courts issue advisory opinions, that it has to be that if you're the person who goes in there and says the FDA did something wrong, then you have a stake. You're not standing in somebody else's shoes. You're not, prevent, you're not providing a general grievance. You are the one who is hurt, and you are the one that can be helped by a favorable decision. Jessica Levinson, thank you, as always.